How's it going, everybody? So quiet. <laughs> Give me a cue. You're on. Good afternoon, school counselors, family, and friends. This is yours truly, Dr. Gail Reed Barnett. I am your professional development chair. Welcome to our first webinar this evening entitled Enhancing School Counselors' Abilities to Aid Students with Autism Spectrum Challenges, presented by Ms. Butler. I just want to give a shout out to uh, my uh, board, my um, co-chairs. I see Michael Gardner is here. I see Dr. Corbett is here. Um, of course, Bob is here because he handles all the production. A special shout out to my class, uh, Mercy University, class 630. Um, ethics. If I haven't, if I've forgotten anyone, you can give it in the chat. If not, um, our presenter, Ms. Tanika Mayhew Butler. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, why don't we give it a couple minutes as people are signing in, okay? Okay, boss. I told see, I told you he's the man. Do I have no, to do the just, script over? Yes. No, just this part. <laughs> guys. Hi, oh, our president is here, Marjorie Miller, <laughs> president of the New York State School Counselors Association. Uh, um, a quick shout out if you haven't, you know, registered for our conference, please do so. It's in uh, please, November. Please, please. It's going to be very exciting. We have wonderful presenters, wonderful keynotes. Uh, you will walk away with so many tools in your toolbox, you're going to have to rent a car. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> So while we're waiting for um, a couple of more hundred people. <laughs> um, Put in the chat where you're from. Where I'm from? Oh, Everybody. where am I from? I, I am from. from the wonderful borough of Brooklyn. So those of you who are here, please put in the chat where you're from. And what do you help to get out of this um, our webinar? Buffalo. Wow. All okay. right. We got both ends of the state. Kansas All right. <laughs> yeah, we got from Buffalo to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn. That was, that was good. <laughs> Long Island Ridge, which is okay. Long Island. We got Queens, Putnam County. Port Jefferson, okay. Newburgh. Westchester. Kathy's all over the place. <laughs> She's in the witness protection program. Oh, that's what Don't tell like. anybody. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> I think you can start now, Gail. Okay. Um, again, welcome to our first webinar. I am Dr. Gail Reed Barnett. Um, educator, retired school counselor, uh, professor at Queens, um, no, sorry, at Mercy College, Mercy University. We've changed our name. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you um, to our webinar this evening. Um, we're going to learn about autism from our presenter, um, Tamika Mayhew Butler. Tamika Mayhew Butler has a remarkable 27 year journey in education. And gee, I thought she was only 25, but that's okay. She began that journey at Florida AME University, matriculating in 1955 to teach biology, first in Florida and then in Georgia. As a teacher, she became known for her creativity and high engagement with her students and peers. Her desire for a deeper engagement led her pursuing a degree in school counseling from Clark Atlanta University and pivoted to the path of school counseling. In the road, Tamika was able to leverage her insight, knowledge, and experience to impact her school <clears throat> in her county, leading her to recognitions such as Regional Counselor of New Year, I'm sorry, of the Year in Georgia, a presidency of the Cobb School Council Association and a seat on the executive board 
of the Georgia School Council Association. Welcome, Ms. Butler. The floor belongs to you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining. I know you all have been at work all day today, so definitely thank you for joining right now. And let me just say, I am so not tech savvy, so let me make sure I do everything to share the screen properly. Share sound. Stop share. I think I shared. That's the right one. Okay. I'm going to move that there. Move this over here. Okay. So can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. That's yeah. my big thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to slide us off as much as possible. Okay. We just see a big screen that says Zoom. Zoom. You don't see the, okay, let me stop here. I thought I was wondering if I did the right thing. Oh, wrong one. Okay. Now you got it. Can you you got the it. presentation now? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. See it. Yeah. Okay. Look at you. Look, awesome. Tech savvy. Look at you getting it together. Come on. That's, <laughs> no. right. That's right. Oh, no. Yeah. But understand. I have come a long ways. Okay. So uh, once again, I am Tanika Mayhew Butler. And I always tell everyone I started using um, my middle name, which is my maiden name, because I Googled myself a couple of years ago and actually came across another Tanika Butler, spelled the exact same way, living here in the state of Georgia. And we are about a three-year age difference. So wow. I figured, I, I know, I know what's the chance of that. So <laughs> I wanted to, you know, make sure that we were separated from each other. So I started using my maiden name as my middle name. So that's that story. Okay. So, you know, it's not a whole lot of social norms here. Just be present. Um, my goal is to answer any questions you may have at the end. If need be, you know, if you need to stop me, sometimes I can move you know, a lot faster than I probably should during a presentation, but I don't want to keep you on longer than, you know, I have to, but I am willing to stick around. So that's not a problem. Now, what we're going to address today, of course, is how to enhance school counselors ability to aid students on the autism spectrum. And we know that comes with a lot of challenges. So what I hope you can take away is a better understanding of the behaviors commonly associated with autism some best practices, some sensory friendly ideas and transition planning tips. So they read through my bio and I want you all to realize I am a real person. <laughs> that was the last few days that I was in my office. I am a newly retired school counselor. So I retired after 27 years <laughs> and decided to start my own business. So that was one of my moments when I knew I was at the countdown in this picture. I am an autism parent, a consultant, and a support coach, and I'm now the author of two books. Crusade for Kendall is our family's story. It takes you from diagnosis until Kendall is 18, and then Building Bridges is a workbook that I recently um, completed that I felt was needed to support the journey. So our journey. Ooh, our journey basically started when, and I'm just going to go over this quickly, when Kendall was about 14 months, one of my friends, you know, shared with me that she felt like Kendall may have had a, a hearing problem because she was watching Kendall at that time. And that started our journey, simply calling our pediatrician and we went down the road of her, having her hearing tested and everything else. And eventually before she was two, we received an official diagnosis of autism. So this is during our early years when we engaged in a listening program, and you can see she was not very happy with this program, but we feel as if it actually had its benefits because the purpose of it was to desensitize her ears. 
So we feel like it worked because she's not, you know, um, a lot of things don't really bother her when it comes to sound. This was a picture from last year because Kendall is now 22. And here in Georgia, children age out of school the day before their 22nd birthday. So right now she has officially aged out. Her birthday was 9-9. Nine, nine, and we are waiting on a state program for a day program. So that's where we are right now in the process in this journey. So the reason I started presentations, when Kendall was first diagnosed, um, I was working in the school system and it was the same system that of course she was in school. And I also have a son, they're 14 months apart. And so what we realized was that a lot of the educators, it was not that they did not want to help, they really didn't know a whole lot about autism. And so as we were moving through the system, I was a school counselor, and then I realized even more that no one was sharing information with school counselors. And so I started years ago presenting at conferences. And my main purpose was because I felt like school counselors needed to be a part of the, the team that was working to support the student. So, so I made sure someone needs to mute themselves. Why do you so, feel like you need your rent back? Don't you feel like you have to pay for your own? I can hear it. Uh, yes. Can you milk them, please? Yes, you're asking for that. Yeah. Because I'm not working. That money that she received from me is from Social Security. I just need Social Security. This uh, is what my text is. Everyone. Right? Yeah. And you wouldn't be asking for your money back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And so I started presenting to school counselors simply because I felt like they needed the information just as much as the teachers or administrators needed the information. And that's where the journey began with me presenting to school counselors to bring them to the table because I realized that a lot of school counselors, it was not that they did not want to engage with students that were on the autism spectrum. They just weren't comfortable or confident. And so I wanted to help them feel a little more confident and share with them ways that they could best support students on the spectrum and to let them know it was possible to do classroom lessons with students that are in small group autism classrooms. So to get things going, I'm gonna go through a couple of terms that I feel like you need to know before we move into the best support strategies. One of the things that's big right now um, when a student is diagnosed, they've moved away from the term Asperger syndrome. And you may now hear someone refer to it as level one. So you have level one, level two, and level three. Level one used to be Asperger syndrome. So that individually, individual academically is there. Their concerns typically are more social emotional. Their social skills are lacking. So that means those social cues, they're missing those things. Level two, the individual needs support. However, they do have some independence and their cognitive abilities range um, closely to, they can fall below 70, but that person is able to take care of themselves, but they still need support. My daughter falls at a level two. She needs support. And when it comes to safety, however, she's pretty independent. She is able to take care of herself. However, we have to make sure she is safe. That's where our biggest concern becomes. So she falls into level two. Level three are students who are nonverbal and need extreme support at all times. So right now, the big thing is level one, level two, and level three. I've heard some people say they have a 1.5 diagnosis. That's a bit much. Those three categories are really what the main categories are. Another term that's coming up a lot is neurodivergent. And an individual that is, auti is autistic is also neurodivergent. However, all neurodivergent individuals are not autistic. And that's a big thing right now. Anyone that is ADHD, autism, sensory issues is neurodivergent, but that does not mean they're on the autism spectrum. 
So a lot right now is being used with neurodivergent and neurotypical. So you may see those words used. And some people have actually started using neurodivergent in place of autism. Now, what I want to talk about, and a big part of it for me is the why. You know, why we, give me a second, I want to make sure I can still see my, okay. Why it's important for us to understand the whys of the behavior. So when we think about the whys of the behavior, a big part of things is executive functioning skills. And that is the part of our brain that tells us what to do each and every day. Now, why, why that is so important when it comes to individuals on the spectrum is simply because, a second, why did I just lose myself? Okay. It's simply because when we think about the things we do every day, that's listening, planning, sequencing, organizing things, self-regulation. So individuals on the autism spectrum, there's a deficit in these areas. And with that deficit, that means they're listening to what you're saying and how they respond or how they're able to process it. There's a deficit there. That planning, which basically means telling someone, hey, I want you to get up and go take care of something, may not all be there. So those deficits are there. Some areas are more extreme than others. But executive functioning skills is basically where we see that breakdown. And a lot of times people never talked about how that was the breakdown. They just kind of went into the behaviors. So understand when you have that student who's on the spectrum and you give them something and it seems like 10 minutes later they have misplaced it. It's truly a part of that executive functioning that is there. That deficit is there. So it's not intentional where some parents will say they're really frustrated because the child will get home at the end of the day. And we're talking about an individual on the spectrum who's verbal. And when they ask them about their day, they can't tell them anything. And it's not because that individual is not trying. That just means that's an area that's a deficit for them. And the things we're going to talk about today are ways you can actually support and build those deficits. And it's one of those things that people don't realize you can strengthen some of the skills with work. Now, when we think about the whole thing of the deficits, keep in mind, that that auditory processing is off. So this is a picture of Kendall and I always try to use pictures of Kendall throughout the presentation on our different journey. One of the things that you know stands out, when Kendall was much younger, she really wanted to say the phrase, good night, don't let the bed bugs bite. And she could not give us that statement back. And it wasn't because she did not want to. It was simply because her mind would not allow her to fully string that sentence along. And she would try and try and try, but we never stopped. So I never stopped saying, good night, don't let the bed bugs bite. But I realized it was going to take her time to actually gain and strengthen that skill. And eventually she was able to tell me, good night, don't let the bed bugs bite but it was a process. And that's one of those things people have to understand. I try to tell people it's like 50 first dates. If you remember the movie, 50 first dates, every day when she started, she woke up, it was a new day. She did not remember the previous day. And if you could take into your mind, sometime when you're dealing with students on the spectrum, it's like 50 first dates, it will take your frustration away. Because do not allow yourself to become frustrated with the fact that you may have to introduce yourself every day. You may have to tell them the same thing every day. It's not that they are not trying. It's just simply they're not able to do that, what you're asking, simply because that deficit is there with executive functioning skills. Now, a couple of terms, masking. We see a lot when it comes to masking, and that's basically where the individual on the spectrum will do everything they can to not stand out. They will sit and hold in as much as they possibly can. The downside to that is when they get home, they can explode because they've been fighting to pretend, and that's really what it is, to pretend to be neurotypical. And because they're fighting to do that, that mask they're wearing wears them out. So what we encourage students to do, the more we start talking about autism, is that students don't feel the need to mask who they are. They're able to be comfortable, and that way they're not having to wear the mask. Echoalia or scripting. Echoalia is something we hear a lot about. 
it's basically a way of processing what someone says. So in the video, in the visual you see here, when the person is asked, do you want a banana? And they repeat back, do you want a banana? They're processing what's being asked. So it's not a sign of disrespect, which some people think it is when that person repeats what they were asked. It's a way of processing the information. But as communication skills increase, the echoalia decreases. Also, individuals will respond by reciting lines they've heard from movies because they feel like that's the way to respond. So you'll hear them sometimes when they may not be conversational, but they're quoting lines from movies perfectly because they're just mimicking the sound that they're hearing. Originally, when Kendall first started to speak, she sounded like Elmo because she watched a lot of Sesame Street and she was mimicking what she was hearing. Now, stemming, we hear a lot about stemming and we typically hear a lot of bad about stemming. Stemming has benefits, we all stem. All of you can think of something you do when you start to get antsy, rather you, you know, twitch your leg, tap a pen, we all stem in some way. However, when it comes to stemming and autism, it's gotten a bad rep. And so for years, people would go out of their way to break the stem. That means they would stop the person from stemming. And what we're realizing is we need to avoid that. We, we need to be able to let them stem because it's self-soothing. It's the way we all deal with stress and it's their way. Their way may present differently from what we're used to, but it's still their way of self-soothing. So if the stem does not hurt someone, I know sometimes it can become, you know, something to really work with in the classroom. If it is rather loud and can be distracting, but if you're going to work with someone to remove a stem, you need to replace it with another stem. Your goal is not to try to get them to stop is to replace it with something else. Um, we had a student in the last school, I worked in elementary school for the last five years before I retired. We had a student who loved to touch his classmates skin. Well, in elementary school, everything you know becomes a big issue now. And it was an issue with the parents. Well, it was hard to tell the, the young man because he was on the spectrum to not touch his classmates. So what we were able to do, we were able to find a piece of fabric that gave him the same sensation. And that made him stop rubbing on his classmates. So instead of getting him to stop, we just replaced it with something else that still allowed him to self-soothe. So that's what you want to keep in mind. Hex. Hex are a great resource. You can find them for free. If you just Google pecs, you'll get all of these images. And what they do is put a picture with a word. So for individuals who are nonverbal or preverbal, as some, sometimes people will say, pecs are very useful because it allows them to engage with you without verbally saying something. They can show you a picture. And sometimes you may see that someone has a ring clip with a bunch of pec pictures or they may have a device like an iPad and that's the way they communicate. So keep in mind, you can use those same things to communicate with students. You can also use pet pictures for rules when you're doing a lesson because it allows individuals to see what you're saying. And pet pictures work well with students who speak another language because it provides a picture for the word. So a lot of times people want to equate PECs to just students on the spectrum. Students that struggle with reading, which is something we're seeing across the country right now, can all benefit from seeing PECs sometimes used in when it comes to explaining different things. In the restroom for, you know, whatever the restroom rules may be, you can actually use some PECs as well. Now, sensory seekers and sensory avoiders, that's a big thing. You have students who are sensory seekers, and those are students who will crash into someone else. They'll actually like to run into people all the time, and that's because they like that sensation. They may want to be squeezed all the time. They want to hug. They may want to put on a weighted blanket. Um, it may be soothing for them to walk around parts of the day with a backpack on with heavy books in it because that pressure helps to calm them down. That's the seeker. The avoider does not want any contact with it whatsoever. They are going to avoid sounds. Now, individuals can be both because you can see there are two pictures here of Kendall. Kendall typically is a seeker. 
she, you know, likes to hug on people. Um, she sees that as a form of greeting people. So that's something we have to work on when it's strangers. But she still needs her headphones at particular times. So in this picture, she is on the beach. Every year we go to the beach and we watch the fireworks for the 4th of, Ju 4th of July over the water. But the sound is very loud. So she now knows to grab her headphones. That's not something we have to tell her. Routine. Everybody talks about routine and changing routine when it comes to someone that's on the spectrum. Changing a routine is a big deal. And to give you an idea, when I talk about changing, that picture there was a peck picture Kendall's teachers created for us. They were using it at school when something different was about to happen. So that was their way of letting her know if things were going to change that day. This was the, the Pex picture. And so we had a copy of it as well at home so we could keep consistent, consistency between home and school. So small changes that people don't realize can cause a big problem. Substitute teacher, substitute bus driver. A student getting on the bus with um, that's on the autism spectrum and it's a different bus driver. And then when they get to school, they are off for the rest of the day. And everyone's trying to figure out why. It's because that sub bus driver was there adding a new student to the bus, which will then change the bus route. Small things that we think everyone should be able to get over are really difficult for students that are on the spectrum to move past. So what I've learned over the years is any way that the communication can be there between the home and the school, the home and the bus driver, if you can prepare that person for that change, it's going to go a lot smoother than if you surprise them with the change. So a student showing up in the classroom has been totally transformed, the teacher changed the chairs, that student may be off for the rest of the day. And everyone's trying to figure out what happened. And it's simply because the classroom changed, but it does not mean the teacher can't change her room. It just simply means to let that student know, hey, when you come in here tomorrow, I'm gonna to change the way the desks are in the classroom. So that student is then prepared for what they're going to see the next day. They don't walk in and see the classroom is different. Same thing, if the teacher knows they're going to be out, let that student know, let that parent know so they can let them know, hey, when you get to school, Miss Smith may not be there. She's not going to be there today, but it's going to be okay. You're going to have a sub and everybody's going to take care of you and you're still going to be safe. But when that student arrives and that teacher's not there, the rest of the day is just off track. And that off track could become a major meltdown that can turn into aggression. Social stories are something that you can Google social stories for any topic, and you'll see how the script of the so social story goes. It helps to explain new situations. So over the years, we've had to use social stories with Kendall. And one of the reasons um, I mentioned, I have a son, Kendall and her brother are 14 months apart. However, because of her needs and his needs, once he left elementary school, they were never in school together again because we had to make a decision as, as parents that we could not force him with her because what he needed and what she needed were two different things. So when he went off to school, we had to prepare her for that. And we used a social story to let her know that Julian was going away to college and that it was gonna be okay, that Julian would come home to visit and that it was gonna be okay. And so if you look and Google social stories, you'll see there's a repeat of how the lines go and it basically is letting that individual know what is getting ready to occur is a change, but that is going to be okay. So you can create your own, or you can really Google social stories, autism, and field trip. And you can see how the script goes, and you can actually find where you can amend the script. And it includes most of the time pet pictures as well. So there's a lot that's out there that's free when it comes to social stories. Visual spatial thinking, that's that 3D thinking. When you think about a 3D printer, a lot of individuals on the spectrum think in 3D. They're seeing things from more than just being a picture. They're seeing it from every angle. And one of the leading authorities is Dr. Temple Grandin. Now, I wanted to, hopefully it'll work. I have a video because there was a movie that was done about her life. And the reason she's considered one of the great authorities is because she um, has a lot of sensory needs. 
However, she has been able to go on to get her doctorate degree because people realized her needs and they met her needs. But people had to understand that this was who Temple was and they were willing to make the accommodations or modifications. Bob, can you mute them? Thank you. So, okay. I'm sorry, Ms. Bala, go ahead. Problem. Let me, I move this down. Let me see, hopefully a video will play. This is a trailer for a movie that was made a couple of years ago, but it's a great movie. This is just a clip to give you an idea how Temple thinks when I mentioned the uh, visual spatial thinking. My name is Temple Grandin. I'm not like other people. She's an amazing visual thinker. Are you a scientist? I used to work for NASA. Mm -hmm. Can you bring everything you've seen to your mind? Sure. Wow. Can't you? Excellent work, Temple. Really excellent work. How'd you figure that out? So you can see all around without moving his head. How is she? She's good. You do remember, though, something's gonna set her off. When was she diagnosed? She was four. Temple! I have done everything that I can for Temple. We know how different she is. Different, not less. You have a very special mind, you know that? Think of it as a door. A door that's going to open up onto a whole new world for you. Pick a subject. Cows? The colleges with cows? Yes, they do. Why are some mowing more loudly than others? There must be a reason they're saying something. Well, I reckon you could get Dr. Doolittle alone out here. He probably could tell you. <laughs> mooing. You want to do research and write your master's on mooing. I can see a shoot just as a cattle will because that's something my autism lets me do. You wacko. I know my system will work because I've been through it a thousand times in my head. My husband read about you. Miss Grandin, this is a masterpiece. I don't want my thoughts to die with me. I want to have done something. It's nothing short of a miracle. My name is... So that was just a trailer of the, the movie itself. If you get an opportunity, I strongly recommend watching the movie. It's very insightful into the way someone on the spectrum, their mind works and the way they see things. So it's really a great movie. She did a wonderful job. They actually, if I'm correct, received an award and everyone was surprised because Dr. Temple Granlin was actually able to attend, but she admitted she had to be heavily medicated because it was going to probably overstimulate her to be in the presence of so many people with so many lights and cameras, but she was able to attend. Now, we've gone through some, some terms that'll help us better understand. Now, addressing concerns and challenging behaviors, it's all about for me when you're thinking about things from being a proactive approach. That's really what it's all about. If you can do something to prevent the behavior, it keeps you from having to then deal with the behavior. So a big part of things sometimes is being proactive. Now, here's something I think is very you know, meaningful to keep in mind. When you cut it for me, write it for me, find it for me, open it for me, tie it for me, all I learn is that you do it better than me. So we wanna make sure that even though we're working with students on the spectrum, if they have the ability to do something, it may not be as fast as we want it to happen, allow them to do it because we need to teach them that what they're doing and how they do it is okay. We don't want to set them up to feel like they're helpless. Now, keep this in mind, an escalated adult cannot de-escalate an escalated child. The best thing to do is to walk away. And I know that's easier said than done, but when you realize you're getting worked up, walk away, because all it's gonna become is a battle of wills. One person, you're upset and that child is upset. So if you're not the calm person, then walk away and let someone else step in. Facial expressions. This is my son, Julian. So I try to use my own kids in the pictures. And you can see this is just a soccer game. But sometimes when we are fussing at individuals, if you've never watched yourself when you're fussing with someone, your facial expressions can become entertainment for someone that's on the spectrum. 
So, and I know it's hard to keep your express expressions at a minimum sometimes, but be mindful. If you get overworked up, even if it's with excitement, it could become a situation where the student does something because they want to see you get worked up because they think it's funny. Purposeful pause. When we speak with individuals that are on the spectrum and we talked about executive functioning, we need to allow them time to process what we're asking. So when we ask a question, instead of expecting an immediate result, we need to pause. So if I ask a student, would you like a cookie or a bag of chips? I need to be able to pause. And I know that pause is awkward and count to about three to five to allow that student to process what was asked. When we you know, go into the next statement too quickly, what happens is we've confused them because that executive functioning part that is a deficit there does not allow them to keep making that jump and change with what you're saying. So ask that question and then stop and pause and allow them to respond. Communication, keep it short and simple. Sometimes we don't realize how long-winded we can become. That's something I have to work on myself, but it's best to keep those statements short. And I encourage you to say the student's name. If you are addressing Kendall and you just walk in a room and start talking, she does not realize you're talking to her. So when you say, Kendall, what are you doing? Then she realizes she needs to listen because you're trying to engage her in conversation. However, without that, she'll just continue to do what you're doing and you could be having a full thing of asking her something and she's not responding. So keep in mind, it's not that someone is ignoring you. Maybe they don't realize you're speaking to them because you're not using their name. Now, when it comes to the things we say, we want to make sure in keeping it simple that we also use a direct response. So here's a situation. It's raining outside and dad yells, stop, be careful. The individual then comes in the house and treks in their muddy feet. And the parent is trying to figure out what happened. Where a different way of saying that is stop, be careful and wipe your feet. So I've given you the directive to stop and to wipe your feet before you come into the house. So we've got to be mindful that sometimes we expect that individual to understand the second part, but we've got to be very clear at what we're asking them to do. So instead of just saying stop, I need to remind them to be careful and wipe their feet as well so that they don't trek the mud through the house. Lessons. It's really possible to do lessons when it comes to smaller group classrooms. And I know that's something that a lot of school counselors try to avoid because it's a level of discomfort and not really knowing what to do or how to do things. What I suggest is before you go into that classroom, visit the classroom. Make a habit of going in to visit. And by visiting, what you're doing is you're watching the teacher to see what she's doing. You're watching the students to see how they're interacting in the room. Students on the spectrum take sensory breaks. So that means they may hop on a trampoline. They may move around on top of a, a beach ball. They may get on the floor, but they're actually still listening. And so when you visit that classroom, you're watching to see how those students are dealing with their sensory breaks in the classroom so that when it happens, when you go in for your lesson, it doesn't throw you off, that you'll then understand that that student is just taking a break. And that's where a lot of people struggle because they want to make everyone sit in the seat. And that's a bit too much. So a student that's bouncing on a trampoline is listening to you. So you want to make sure, visit the classroom. The students then will get to know you. And once they get to know you, it's going to make things much better when you go into the classroom. But just pop in and visit for a short amount of time so they are comfortable with you and they realize that you're a person that they can trust. And then watch how the teacher operates in the room. When you go in for a lesson, whatever you can do, try to become part of the story if you're reading the story. So one of my story, one of the books I really like is the Energy Bus for Kids. And simply, that's a poster board. And I made myself into a bus, but it captured their attention. So it's all about, you know, sometimes we got to morph ourselves a little bit. Rather, it's a T-shirt or whatever the case may be. I admit, I can be a little extra sometimes. Let me just say that, and I understand that. But 
it's going to help with the lesson because it pulls them in with that level of excitement. Here's another picture where it's a story, um, Piper Sky. And, you know, I dressed like the book character before I went into the room and read the book. I actually popped into a couple of classes that day. I always say I'm not going to waste a costume. So I'm going to pop in as many as I can possibly pop into so they can see the character. I'm bringing the character to life. And then we have Tiana. Once again, it's just going into character. And I admit my doing may be a bit much, but keep in mind, whatever you can do to kind of make things a little more exciting, keep that in mind because it's going to pull that student in. And that's what we want to do when we think about our students on the spectrum. We want to engage them and, and get them to realize you're someone they can relax with, you're a safe person, and that you're going to do something that's going to be fun. Now, boom cards are a great way, I'm going to see, hopefully this will work, with creating an interactive lesson. Let me see, this is my dashboard. There's a free membership with Boom Cards, and Boom Cards allow you to have an interactive lesson with the whiteboard. So here's one on community helpers. And so you see the picture, I'll click next. And with the smart board, the student goes up and they can just press the answer. So if I press the wrong answer, it lets them know, and then I can return and press the correct answer. And it goes on to the next one. So I hit that one. And you can see if you don't like some of the cards, you can hide them. So that is a great way come back out to engage with students and create an interactive lesson. There are free boom cards. You can actually create your own boom cards as well. It's up to you. But understand there are free ones that are out there and available. Watch what we say. Idioms. You know, we don't realize how much we use phrases like cat has my tongue or I have butterflies in my stomach. You're the apple of my eye. When we're thinking about students on the autism spectrum, they're visual thinkers. So they're actually visualizing what you're saying. And when you think about it, that sometimes probably can be a bit much. So whenever you're having those lessons, you want to make sure you're not really using a lot. If you can avoid them at all, definitely do and keep the language very simple and short. But keep in mind when you use those, you know, idioms that they're actually thinking about what you're saying. Give me my quick respect. If you hear someone running down the steps in my house, that's my daughter right now. She's deciding she wants to start running. It's always amazing to me. Okay. Now, in working with students on the spectrum, we want to make sure we're building relationships with them that are outside of just the classroom. So because I had hallway duty every day in the afternoon, what I was able to do was capture the student's attention because I had this smiley face flag. And so they began to recognize me for that smiley face flag. So you want to look for ways to build relationships for with all students. But when you're thinking about your students on the spectrum, sometimes you may have to do a little bit more. And this was something that captured their attention because they thought the smiley face was cute. Then I was able to turn around and flip that into a lesson to let them know your school counselor is here to make you smile. And they created smiley faces. So it's one of those ways of connecting seeing me in the hallway to build that relationship and then taking it to the classroom. Groups. We hear a lot about people are always saying form a group, form a group, form a group. And that's cool and everything, but all groups don't need to just be friendship groups. Safety awareness. It's something when we're thinking about our students that are on the autism spectrum. And that safety awareness could be having those conversations, kind of doing some activities that everyone is not your friend. And that's something that a lot of times people forget. They don't know that. So they think that everyone is their friend. So when you have those groups, you're doing more than working on friendship. Think about safety awareness. Um, have the conversation that people talk about stranger danger. Everyone's not your friend. Those are things you can do. Processing challenging situations. And it also deals with the level of the student on the spectrum, but think more than just a friendship group. Think about ways that what you're doing is actually going to impact them, you know, long-term in life. Now, here's a quote from Dr. Temple Grandin. 
to think about. I strongly recommend that students with autism get involved in special interest clubs in some of the areas they're naturally, they naturally excel at. Being with people who share their thoughts makes socializing easier. So if you notice that a student is fixated, and I, people hate fixation, has a strong interest when it comes to Legos, then if there's a Legos club, it may be something that you want to encourage them to join. And what we've yes. got to realize is that we've got Can we've I got to open the door screen? for Will all they, clubs. Why is my screen dark? So we want to make sure we're thinking about that. I had a student that was on the spectrum that really enjoyed Hot Wheel cars. And so I reached out to some other teachers and asked them, do they have other students that were interested in Hot Wheel cars? And I was able to form a group with students that were some were on the spectrum and some were not, but they were interested in Hot Wheel cars. So it was a way to work on social skills without actually being a social skills group. Also, there's a five second rule for impulse control. This is one of those things with executive functioning that can be a struggle, that impulse control. And we hear about it a lot with individuals that are on the spectrum. And it's something that we can work on and try to build and strengthen. So that five second rule is once you identify what's a trigger for that individual, and they may be able to tell you, their parents may be able to tell you, the teacher may be able to tell you, then if cognitively that student is able to, you can then work on getting them to realize this is something that sets you off. And I want you to count to five whenever it happens so that you don't just immediately respond because that immediate response sometimes cannot be the best. Sometimes it's a meltdown and it can come off in an aggressive way. So it's a skill to work on, but it really, it depends on the cognitive level of the individual to work on it. Now, inclusion. Of course, I would love for everything to be inclusive in society, but it's a process that we're having to go through and we're learning ways we can be a more inclusive society. This is a PECS picture that um, this bulletin board has been added in a couple of schools on the playground, but it's also something that could be placed on all levels, even the lunchroom. So it allows someone that may not have the, be the best verbal skills to still interact with others because that person can point to a picture and they can have a conversation to see, do you want to come sit at this table with me by pointing to the table and lunch? And then that person can realize that that's what that they're being asked to do. So this works well on the playground, but it can also work in a cafeteria so that students can find friends because we have to remember Students do age, and as they age, they start to realize that there's something different, but they still don't want to be that child that stands out. So they're different, but not less. So anything we can do to help create more of an inclusive society, the better we are. When you think about providing praise, be very specific. Don't just say great day. Point out to them that they did a great job working in a group, that they did a fantastic job, you know, maintaining their emotions. They did a really good job when it was not their turn. So we want to be very specific about what we acknowledge, because what we're doing then is what's called positive reinforcement. We are encouraging the behavior we want to see. Unfortunately, what happens a lot of times, we don't encourage the behavior we want to see. We just criticize the behavior we don't want to see. And we think that's going to produce the behavior we want to see. And that's not the case. We want to encourage the behavior we want to see so that the student will continue to do that behavior because they want the encouragement. Now, when you're thinking about students on the spectrum, keep in mind, of course, we're talking about all levels, but we've got to start creating that mindset because all students that are on the spectrum, that level may be a level one, level two, or level three. But we want to make sure that they realize that there are other individuals who are on the spectrum and that there are some celebrities. And so when we introduce them to those celebrities, we create the mindset that if they can do it, so can I. So here are a few you know, that you can kind of share. One of the big ones right now is a young man who is a NASCAR driver. 
So if that student is into cars, you can see where they will be really excited to see that there is an individual who's on the spectrum who is actually driving for NASCAR right now, which for me is so exciting because I don't know how they deal with all the sensory issues and speed and the turns, but this is something we can share to let them see, hey, there are people that are celebrities on the spectrum just like you and they're doing great things. Here's another one we all know about Albert Einstein. A lot of people, Chris Rock came out recently in the last couple of years and basically with what they're calling level one and it's nonverbal language disorder. And I always say, if you think back to probably some of the characters he probably was really good at, he was probably really good at them because they were a big part of who he really was. So he admits he struggled with things when it comes to reading social cues from individuals. He doesn't pick up on things as easily. So it's one of those things as well to have that, that conversation. He can do it, so can I. And then the next one is not that he's autistic, but I thought it was interesting that Steve Jobs is actually was dyslexic, which would explain why the Apple features are all icons because it took away from him having to worry about the word. So that's interesting as well. Now, next thing we definitely want to make sure we are remembering, the sibling. I cannot stress that enough. I mentioned earlier that Kendall and her brother are 14 months apart. His name is Julian. And it's very easy sometimes when we are working in schools, the focus becomes on the individual that's on the spectrum and we forget about the, the sibling. And we wanna make sure that as school counselors, we are thinking about that sibling and how we can support them as well. So here's a quote I think is very interesting. Um, we will become caregivers, and it's from a sibling. We will become caregivers for our siblings when our parents no longer can. Anyone interested in the welfare of people with disabilities ought to be interested in us, the sibling. So we've got to keep that in mind that we're meeting the needs of the sibling as well, and we're not forgetting about them because it's easy to forget about them. At home, things may be totally about that, that other individual. So we want to make sure that we're not overlooking them as well. Now, something I strongly encourage, and I know sometimes as counselors, we don't have any say in this, but we want to let the sibling be a student at school. At home, they may be a caregiver. That parent may put that responsibility on them to make sure that person takes a bath, that they get dinner. So when we're at school, we don't want to put them in a caregiver role and what I've noticed sometimes when there's a problem with a student that's on the spectrum, they will get the sibling to deal with it. So we want to encourage sometimes our administrators to realize we need to let that student be a student. And we need to, you know, as adults in the building, handle the situation and not run to that student. Let them be a student, that sibling, and not be the caregiver at school. Um, I'm going to include this clip if I didn't. So I'm not going to show it right now because, of course, I'm thinking about time. But. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize with the Special Olympics, the Special Olympics students can start participating at the age of eight. And they can continue competing depending on the sport until they're tired of competing. So that's really great for that individual that's on the spectrum. Now, here's something a lot of people do not realize exists. There are what's called unified partners with the Special Olympics in some of the sports, sports like soccer, football, basketball, and there's some others. What a unified partner player is, it is an individual without an intellectual disability that is able to compete on the Special Olympics team. So when you think about basketball, that basketball team may be a unified team. And if it's five men on the court, three of the individuals on the court may have an intellectual disability and two, are unified partner players. And the two teams have to match up the same way. So if one team has two partner players on the court, the other team has to have two partner players. And so a lot of people don't realize that that's an opportunity for that sibling to play a sport with their sibling. So Kendall has played with Special Olympics since she was eight. And once she was in middle school, we moved to soccer and that became our sport. Her brother Julian has been playing soccer since he was a kid. The coach asked us, was he interested in being a unified partner player? We had no idea what that was. And when she explained, that basically gave him an opportunity to compete. And they play on the same team. 
he still continues to play because that's the summer games and they're in May. They actually just played together in May of 2023 and they were on the same team. So being a unified partner player allowed us to experience something we didn't think we would ever experience, which was the two of them playing on the team together. And that partner player gets medals and everything else, just like the um, Special Olympic athlete. So they're all given medals. They all participate in the awards. Everything is the same. Now, this video clip, and, and if I didn't include it in the workbook, I'll send it out, comes from a few years back when my son was chosen as one of the all-star unified players. And it shares a story that was done on CNN with positive athletes of how with the unified teams across the country, they compete. And a lot of people don't realize that. And so the same way they have an all-star game, there's a unified partner Special Olympics all-star game. And so in 2018, he and along with another um, player were the all-star players. And this is a video clip. So if I didn't, I'll send it to you, uh, Michael, so that you all can see it because it gives the story and lets you see how great that bond is. The young man that's in the video with my son, they're still they still communicate with each other. So it's a bond, and they were together in 2018, and we're in 2023. So keep that in mind. Unified partner players is something to look into. Now, moving away from the siblings, sensory friendly. We're kind of hearing a little bit about sensory friendly right now. And basically, when something is sensory friendly, that means we have a reduced number. We're thinking about lowering the lights. We're thinking about the atmosphere. So as a council, one of the things, of course, at different places, you know, you have to participate in activities. We have a science night because my last couple of years were in elementary school and we were told we needed to be there. And so my solution was, hey, can we have a sensory friendly room? And I was given the okay. So what I did was away from that science night, big activity, I set up a smaller room off to the side. And that smaller room was the lights were lower. There were still activities, but there were fewer students. So it allowed students that were on the spectrum to not become overstimulated. They were able to come that night and participate in activities for the science night. And the parents were really happy. Now to make sure the parents knew, we had to call and let the parents know that we were going to have a separate sensory friendly experience for science night because parents are just used to that not occurring. So when you do something like a sensory friendly event, you wanna make sure you let those parents know, um, the parents of autistic kids because they're not expecting that type of setup. Transitioning from one level to the next. This picture here is from the year Kendall was entering middle school. We thought we had done everything to prepare her. We met the teacher beforehand. We visited the school. Um, we had a video just kind of showing around the school, everything possible. And we forgot one thing. We did not discuss with her the difference in school hours. And that's one I always encourage people when students make that change, if the school hours are going to change when they move from elementary to middle or middle to high, include that in the conversation about the transition. Needless to say, she had a rough first day because she wanted school to end the way it had ended for the previous six years from kindergarten through fifth. So when we're thinking about transition, some of the things we can do to support a school counselors, we can encourage them to provide a PowerPoint or pictures of that new classroom that teacher so that over the summer, the student can you know, get familiar with what's gonna happen next. Compare school hours. Make sure they realize if it's an hour change, if they're gonna to go to school later, they understand if they're gonna get out early or whatever it may be, go over that information. Then there's a getting to know portfolio you can do. And I'll show you an example. And basically it's something we learned was really helpful with Kendall as she moved through school. We would put together what we call a getting to know Kendall portfolio. And what it provided were things about Kendall that were not listed in her IEP. We wanted them to know, you know what things worked for her as far as rewards, um, that she was afraid of flying bugs. And that when it comes to a flying bug, safety goes out the window, she's gonna dart off. That she goes on vacation, that she has a family. It gave a lot of those things that allowed the person to know more about her. And we didn't just give the portfolio to the teacher. We would give it to anyone that interacted with her. The school nurse, because she took meds at school, the bus driver, if there was a monitor on the bus, the principal, AP, everyone, we gave them a folder. 
because we wanted them to know who she was. Because sometimes when you look at documents for students, you only see the bad side of things or it's very little information. And then make sure if you're on a high school level that you check in with parents for children that are on the spectrum if they're not projected to, to, to attend college or tech school. We're sometimes, we're left out a lot of times. So you wanna make sure don't just rely on a case manager or because they have an IEP. As a school counselor, just check in with that parent to see if they have the information they need or if there are activities that they may not know about that they may wanna participate in. Now, endless ideas of how you can use some things. This is basically just a paper, um, a poly folder with a button. When Kendall was younger, she carried papers with her. And one day in elementary school, they flew across the parking lot and scared everybody half to death because she went running behind them. And so what we came up with was a way to hold those papers together. And so we would stick those items. We can all probably think about a student on the spectrum that carries a lot of little things with them. This is an idea that helps them keep those items together. And that's just a simple poly envelope that snaps. Combination locks. We work with kids, I know, here in Georgia when it comes to those combination locks when kids are transitioning and they're going to have a locker. Well, part of it is just learning the skill within itself. And when we're trying to teach that skill when it comes to students that are on the spectrum, and this works for students that um, may struggle academically as well, sometimes when we take the numbers away, because if you're off with that number, it's not going to open. They actually have letter combination locks to practice with. And it's much easier to open a letter combination lock than it is to open a numbers combination combination lock. So the big thing is about having students on the spectrum experience success. And the way they can do that when you're having that activity or that lesson is to have them practice with a letter combination lock as opposed to a number combination lock. Now, also keep in mind, sometimes for the student, it's not that they can't open the lock. They can't remember which way to turn. Well, this is something simple that you can do that it lets them know which way to turn. That's all they need reminding of. If they're you know, able to re be reminded of this and this is where you empower them with that executive functioning skill, you put something in place to help them. This doesn't give away their combination. It just lets, and it may let some of their friends next door remember which way to turn as well. But this just lets them know which way to turn to open the lock. Personal space. We talked about how some kids are seekers and some kids are avoiders. Um, and they may not understand personal space. One of the ways you can work on personal space is with hula hoops. So as you see this person standing and they're in the middle of a circle, hula hoops come in different sizes. And what you can then is put that hula hoop on the ground. And that allows that person that's on the spectrum to visually see. Because remember, they're visual at how they see things. It allows them to visually see where they should not enter or walk up on a person. So we can create those moments for them and helping them understand personal space because just telling someone may not work this on the spectrum. Allow them to visualize it. If you don't have a hula hoop, you can use a pool noodle as well. And you just basically have that pool noodle cut at a distance enough so that when you're holding the pool noodle out, that that person realizes that that's how far they should stand back from someone. So keep in mind, you're dealing with someone on the spectrum. Think about ways you can make sure they are visually seeing what you're saying to them. Now, here's something with transitioning and as well with maps. Making that transition to the next school and just kind of becoming familiar with the building. Sometimes you can take a map of the building and let them see, hey, I'm your school counselor and this is where I'm located in the building. And then this is where you're gonna be located in the building. We can use that map if you have one-way hallways in the school. All of those things can help them see what they're going to experience to help with their anxiety. So maps exist of all schools simply for safety reasons and the things we've dealt with over the last couple of years. It's just asking for a copy of that map and then putting arrows or adding pictures for that student. If they see the nurse every day, maybe you want to add a picture of where the nurse is located. You know, if the principal is okay, add a picture of this is where the principal office is going to be. But it's all about providing that visual for those students on the spectrum to help with that anxiety. This is another skill that can help to build executive functioning skills. This is a tag. A lot of students that struggle with executive functioning skills forget what to bring home every day. 
And this is just a tag to remind them, do you have your homework binder, your book? It could simply mean, do you have your lunchbox and your water bottle? But no one, you know, it's just for them to see as a reminder what I need to bring home every day and to check. And if it's an instrument, maybe it says, bring your instrument home. This is simply a piece of paper that's laminated. You don't have a laminator, you could use shipping tape. Just make it and then cover it with tape and trim it. But it's a way to help someone that's on the spectrum strengthen that executive functioning skill of not remembering. Across the country every year, Tim Tebow does what's called a Night to Shine event. This event is a prom that is for individuals with special needs. It's a free event. It's given, it goes on across the country on the same day. It's usually in February. The date kind of changes, but it's typically around that Valentine's President weekend. And it's a free event. It's not a one-time event. The individual can attend it every year. This was the year Kendall attended. This was 2020. This was right before the pandemic. This was in February, and of course, the world shut down in March. So the students are greeted like celebrities. They're here. They're paired up with a partner for the event. That partner knows everything about them. They know if that student needs help going to the restroom, if they have food allergies, there's a calming room for them to maybe step away from the big crowd of events. It's a really great event for students to participate in, and some students do it every year. There also is a sensory friendly entrance and that's where no one cheers, but they just kind of clap like this for the students as they come in so that they're not overloaded um, sensory wise. So look into it. It happens across the country. It's a free event and it just happens at churches, but it's typically one of the things that students really enjoy. Now, when we're thinking about those ideas of things, armbands are very useful. You can take these armbands, you can get them really cheap. You can write messages to students to let them know that positive, that um, specific praise. You can write a message on the armband and that student can receive that. And you know that's that way of building that relationship with that student as well. So they come in different colors. They actually come with smiley faces on them. It's so many things you can write on these armbands that it's not just for your students on the spectrum. They really work well with all students but it's something you can do with your students that are on the spectrum to let them know, you know, it could be simply you wrote that a smiley face and saying hello, but you're interacting, you're building that relationship. Another thing are anxiety rings. Now, if a student is really small and they have an oral fixation, I don't recommend these, these rings. However, they fit like a ring on the finger and the individual is able to kind of play with it as a fidget. That's not a distraction in class because sometimes when we give a student the ball, they start bouncing the ball, throwing the ball at the wall, throwing the ball at another kid, and then the teacher's mad at you. So this is something that allows a student to, you know, deal with their anxiety without causing a disruption in the class. The only thing is they're not supposed to just leave it on all day. So, you know, when they're dealing with it and playing with it on their hand, fine, but when they're not to take it off, because if you leave it on like anything else, you come become desensitized to it. So it's a really cool thing. You can get them in packs of like 20 for little or nothing on Amazon. Now, I know I went through a lot of information and I know I'll probably run over time too, but I think I did better than I expected. <laughs> so one of the things I want to remind you- You're doing you of, a good job, I, keep it up. <laughs> one of the things I just want to remind you all, you know, I'm not far removed. Literally my retirement date was 6-1-2023. I chose to do what I'm doing right now simply because I understand what it means to be a parent. Um, I understand what it means to be a parent with a child on the autism spectrum. I understand what it means to be a school counselor. And I understand both the, all of those things pre-pandemic and post-pandemic because they're different. And I want you all to realize if no one else is telling you that you're doing a great job, you're doing a great job. One of the things I always say is whenever I was having a bad day, I would go pop in because I built that relationship with my smaller classrooms. And I promise you, those students will make you feel like you are a superstar when you step in the door. That was my place to go to instead of running to the restroom to close the door. Let me go in there and they're going to make me feel like a superstar and I can engage with them because the love is genuine. The reaction is genuine. So keep that in mind. 
Now, I want to definitely leave you with this. Zealous, that's you. You are incredibly enthusiastic and dedicated. You show intense passion and commitment towards students. You display unwavering dedication and zeal. Never forget, you are zealous and you're needed. We, you know, cannot do, um, everybody can't do our job. Let me just say that. And, you know, we have to remind them sometime that we are a specialty when it comes to assisting students and remind them of students and their different needs. So you may have to remind some people about some things that, you know, may have sparked something with you when you go back to work that they may be doing and you're like, hey, maybe we should try this and see how this works. That's what it's all about. We've got to have that conversation where they may not be familiar with something and you realize, hey, if we try this, if we try this proactive approach, things could possibly be better for us and for that student. And that's what it's all about. So questions. I got Any a few questions? I got a few of them. Before we, before we answer the question, I just want to yes. intro introduce you to uh, Michael Gardner. He is my co-chair and he's been answering questions and, and hold on to questions. So thank you, Michael. Yes. I uh, Ms. Butler, I can't thank you enough for your presentation. I'm sitting here. I'm enlightened. I had, I have, I have, I'm happy. I had tears. I mean, it's yes. just wow, you know. Um, and 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 hopefully, um, we can have you back again to to expand yes. on and what you yes. what you have been doing. So congratulations to you because you do thank have you. an understanding of what it is mm -hmm. to have children that are, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm going to use the word special as something that's wonderful um, yes. because it takes a special person to, 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 to deal with what you're dealing with. Cause I have mm -hmm. clients that can't deal with their special children and I'm trying to, you know, help them through that. Uh, but it's a special yes. gift. So I thank you for that. Um, Michael, you. you can answer all the questions. <laughs> yes. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, truly appreciate it. Again, my name is Michael Gardner. I am the yes. co-chair. I have been working with Ms. Butler <laughs> and getting her on here so that you guys can see her because I knew once I saw her presentation in Atlanta, I knew that she would be helpful around the world. So Ms. Butler, thank I you. did grab some of the questions. Okay. The first question was, Usually, students get an IEP classification of speech and language impairment. It is very rare mm -hmm. uh, that families accept an autism classification. Somebody asks, why is mm -hmm. that? It's the denial. Um, you know, I actually started doing, if you go and follow me on Facebook, I started doing a Tuesday Live simply because it is a form of embarrassment and a taboo topic. People feel like they've done something wrong when they have a child on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's a question of, did I do this? What did I mess up on? Why mm -hmm. is my child not able to do these things? And so because of that, they don't want to hear that something is wrong. A really good book is um, Holly Robinson Pete. Her husband wrote a book and the title of the book is Not My Son. And it goes through how he was in denial when his son was first diagnosed. So to answer that question, a lot of people don't want to hear that because they feel as if it's something so negative, it reflects on who they are and their parenting. So I started the conversations on Tuesdays because I want us to start talking more about autism. And the more we talk about it, then parents won't be so apprehensive about a diagnosis. People will dance around it and say they have sensory issues when really just tell me they're autistic because when you let someone know what's going on, they can best support that student. So when a parent is in denial, if they don't want to hear the diagnosis, I say interact with the student based on what you know they probably need. You can't change their IEP and you may not get that parent to come on board, but encourage them. That's the reason, like I said, I retired early because I didn't want to be held into what I could say and how I could speak even though I'm not going to speak anything crazy, but I want it to be free of the restraints of, oh, if I say something, what's going to happen when I get to work? Because I'm thinking from things from that parent and that school system, but parents really, they feel like they've done something wrong. I can admit myself. I tell everybody, I wrote the story about our journey with a crusade for Kendall because I felt like no one was having the conversation. And I explained to people, we haven't had a, a perfect journey. 
by no means. We've dealt with a lot of ups and downs. We've dealt with moments where we're both two college educated parents and questioned, did we do something wrong? So I know that feeling and there was no one for us to talk to about it. So the more we're talking about it, the more we take away that stigma that you have done something wrong. And that's really what it comes down to. We've got to start having the conversations and not providing or looking at people as if we're judging them. So when we judge someone else, then parents are like, I'm not going to say anything about my child because I don't want you to judge me. So it's just, it's a process. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's an amazing answer. Uh, The next one is, how can you handle a mandated counseling group where you have a mix (laughs) neurotypical and neurodivergent students in the same group. (laughs) How can you tactfully explain the behaviors of autistic students to the others and teach patience and understanding without saying too much? Um, Okay. And I always say, don't out a kid. We were really big on, we as we out at Kendall. And our point was, I needed you to realize she was different, but she wasn't less. Now there is, I'm trying to see, I think I have the book in one of my upcoming slides. Yes. This book right here, My Friend with Autism. When we talk about things and not out the student, we're putting a general conversation out there explaining how students are different. So this is a really old book, but it is a great book. So when you have both in the group, you talk about topics that, yes, I'm gonna talk about how students are different and I'm gonna talk about autism, but then I may talk about someone that has Down syndrome. I may talk about someone with something else. So I have that cultural exchange happening so that I'm not necessarily outing a student, but then for the neurotypical student in the group, based on something I said, they're gonna realize, aha, that's what's going on over here with Kendall without me actually even outing Kendall. So My Friend with Autism is a really good book. This book here is a book about Dr. Temple Grandland, and it's a children's book. It's a great book as well. So we want to make sure we're having conversations about inclusion and how students are different. And so that's going to help because students are very smart. They're going to realize, okay, that's what's going on over here. And they just now have a better understanding. Where we have gone wrong as a society is not having students mix as much as they should. And so because we haven't done that, the students are like, what's going on with them? I don't understand what's wrong with them. Instead of realizing, oh, that student is on the spectrum. That student has downs, whatever the case may be. So have a conversation, have some activities that you kind of address all types of students and being inclusive, students that may be blind, students that may have dyslexia, students that may have Tourette's, And when we talk about those things, then they're going to start to notice that you're referring to someone in the group without you outing the person in the group. And if you have a student, so that book I had that you see on the screen, I had a young man who did not realize that um, he was on the spectrum. So when I shared the book with him, I covered up the outside cover. So he didn't see that part. And then I kind of went through and taped off certain pages. So we talked about how to be a friend without actually making him realize that he was a student that was struggling with the friendship. I hope uh, whoever asked that question, I can't see you right now, got that. But uh, the last com- the last question was, you know, uh, autism classification is not on IEPs. Why? Uh, you know, Mrs. Butler's thought was have the conversation and open up the floor, open up the floor to have those conversations. Why isn't it? Mm-hmm. A uh, classification on the IEP change it, right? Um, and- schools really don't provide an autism diagnosis. They're looking to provide a diagnosis where there's a learning disability. So a lot of times, I tell people the starting point is a pe- pediatrician. So very rarely it may say that student is autistic. When Kendall first started school, we had an official autism diagnosis from a developmental pediatrician. So it has always been a part of her IEP. But for some students, it's not a part of their IEP. You just see the sensory issues that are there. And that's where um, it's just one of those things. If there has not been an official diagnosis, it's not going to be an IEP. It's, It's one of those things that's really tricky with the assessment that was done. But schools are really looking for a deficit. They're not looking to diagnose anything. And that's what people don't realize. That school system is really not there to be the place to diagnose everything. 
we're looking for deficits and how we can make up and improve and accommodate and modify to help that student, not to provide a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And just that last question, you know, just trying to get kids that are not on the spectrum, just do a presentation about inclusion and explaining different types of yes. neurotypical behavior. So yes, allowing yes. to see like, hey, oh, someone may be like that, but I don't need to point it out or say that person is like that. Let's not call anyone. Correct. Right? Correct. Yes. Um, and I have, we. so we're going to end in another, I guess, like three to four minutes. We got to finish up 525. Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Dr. Yes. Um, quick question. How would, how would a school counselor, what, yeah, it is, you're right. The DOE does not test for autism, but how, what is it? Is there something that a counselor needs to look for to maybe suggest to a parent or in your opinion, in your profession, what do you think should kind of the right way to go? I don't I I always say don't suggest anything to a parent because then that puts the school system on the hook. Yes. <laughs> so what you kind of, you know, deal with are concerns that may be sensory issues by saying, you know, I notice sometimes when we are in an assembly that that Kendall is struggling or whatever. What are some things you all do? Do you go to the movies? And mm -hmm. how do they handle the movies? So you really have to kind of work your way around the conversation. But if you suggest it, with the right parent. And when I say right, that parent could pursue it as in the school is now on the hook because you told me my child was autistic. No, I don't, we're not telling that the child is. Oh. We're just okay. telling that never, 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 never. Okay. Uh, because okay. so, in my <laughs> in my profession as a school counselor, I, um, I've had to speak to parents about their child and the no, the school really didn't do anything. And I end up sending them to their um the council person, so, at the, so, mm -hmm. at, um, so they were able to get some help. They were able to go to a school that has, or um, that teach mm -hmm. autism, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, and then what mm -hmm. happens sometimes it could be miscrewed as a behavior problem, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. So instead of a child being misdiagnosed by mm -hmm. the school, you mm -hmm. know, I'm looking for how can we as counselors, I guess, get a better lack of diagnosis when they see a child that's acting out that may not have behavior problem um, yeah, is that, i know it's that million dollar question i know i know <laughs> which is kind of hard to do um mm -hmm. you know when we're you know you're trying not to out a kid but you see some things that can get labeled as behavior mm -hmm. issues and you're thinking it's probably more to this if we were being proactive and some ways approaching this is if they were autistic we wouldn't have the concerns it can become a tricky, tricky situation. Right. Um, you know, you you want to make sure because you don't want people to think that you are the know-it-all. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you are realizing some things that you're thinking, you know what? I think it may be autism to talk to that principal, that assistant principal. You can have that conversation with them and let them know. I don't think it's a behavior problem like we're thinking. Right. I think this child is on the spectrum and they're becoming over you know, sensitized. They're dealing with sensory overload and they're having a meltdown and that meltdown is presenting as aggression, mm -hmm. which is yeah. a lot different than a child who is just a bad child. And so sometimes we have to go to the people who are the, the as I used to say, the mopeds in the building, they get paid more money than anybody else. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then kind of, you know, suggest to them because they may not, they may not see it. They're not looking through that same eye. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where we've got to step in as school counselors and say, hey, I don't think that, you know, Kendall is really this bad child mm -hmm. we're thinking. I think we're dealing with an autistic child and we got to kind of look at some things this way and see if we put some strategies in place to be proactive, if we Excellent. could start to see a decrease in the behavior. Excellent. So, Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I like that response. Mm -hmm. it makes me think about going back to the school system. Now, hey, well, uh, we know you ain't doing that, Dr. Gale. <laughs> All right, so we are at time. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, days and thems, everybody that attended, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. Ms. Mrs. Butler, you are a godsend. There are a lot of people. Well, who thank I hope you. Just, I hope your survey 
blows up the way I know it will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank everyone, you. everyone is really appreciative for the things that you could teach us today. So we truly appreciate you and we look to have you back because hello, people need yes. you. <laughs> yes, 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 most definitely, most definitely. So, but thank you for thinking about me when you were thinking about the webinars you wanted to host this year. You know, I'm always excited because I, I want to help. That's a big part for me is supporting school counselors because we are left out of the conversation. But You're everyone right. wants to bring the child to us when something goes left. So, and, and um, thank you again. Yes. So, once again, follow me on Facebook. I do it live every Tuesday. You can also, I always say that's the way to get a conversation going sometime with a parent that may not want to see things is mm. to say, hey, I came across someone. You may want to watch this live she did on Tuesday and see what they get from it. So it's, it's right. definitely one of those things to do. And let me know. We can work something out. And definitely I'll, I'm willing to come back and, and have a great time with you all. Most thank, you. thank you. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, school counselors. Um, I just want to let you know that we have an upcoming webinar next week on uh, depressive disorders in youth by Dr. O, uh, identifying a great pretender, same time. Uh, the 28th of uh, September, we're going to have elementary school counselors. Welcome back. You can register here on our website. And the uh, uh, webinar on depressive disorders in youth will be October 4th at 4 p.m. Um, again, fill out the survey. And I thank you, everyone, for um, attending um, our webinar um, this evening. Uh, class 630, I'll see you next week. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. See you at the next. Bye. See you guys. Hopefully I'll see you guys all soon. <laughs>